So speaking God's words and as you pray <clears throat> that I will have sufficient vocal power to present this message which is entitled children should not be childish what did I say children, children should not be childish father in heaven I ask in the name of Jesus your son my brother my savior Come very close to all of us, dear God. In this final presentation, give me the right words, the right ideas, the right spirit. Father, if you hadn't put your words in my mouth on previous occasions, put them in my mouth now. Strengthen this voice that you've given to me as I try to use it for your glory. Let your spirit, dear God, administer the words to every listening heart. At the end of this presentation, Father, let decisions be made for the advancement of your kingdom, for the salvation of souls. Thank you for hearing this prayer. I offer it in Jesus' name. God's people say, Amen and Amen. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 1, reading from verse 4. Children should not be childish. Jeremiah 1, reading from verse 4. I read from the King James Version of the Bible. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctify thee, and I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. <clears throat> That's what God tells Jeremiah. Verse 6, Then said I, Our Lord, behold, I cannot speak. What reason did Jeremiah give? For I'm a child. Jeremiah, as a man, tells God, I'm a child. I cannot speak. In all my years of preaching and going around God's green earth, I've run into a lot of people who told me, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that, and I can't do that. Forgetting that with God, all things are possible. When God sent the disciples on the great gospel commission, you know it very well, and Jesus came and spake unto them saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. The word therefore is the result of the fact that I have all power. When I send you, I am sending you in the power that is mine. When you go on a mission authorized by someone who has all power, your concern should not be power. Because he has assured you. Because verse 20 says, Lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Now if he has all power, and he's with you, what is with you? All power, not some, all. Let me make a statement that may shock you. All the resources of the universe are under Christ's control for the benefit of the church. As Ephesians 1, 21 tells us, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Let me say it again. All the resources of the universe are under the control of Christ for the benefit of the church. And so Jeremiah said, Ah, Lord, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. And God tells Jeremiah, don't be childish. Don't be silly. Don't say that. That's a very powerful psychological principle. There are some things we should not hear ourselves say. Any good teacher will tell you that he or she will not tolerate a child in a class saying, I cannot do algebra. 
No good teacher will tolerate that. The teacher will say, no, don't say that. Let's try. Because the moment you say, I cannot, that enters your head and it's in there. And as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so when Jeremiah said, Ah, Lord, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Now you may consider yourself a child if you go to speak your words. Then you've got a problem. But if you're going to speak the words I give you, you're not a child. Don't say that. Be not afraid of the faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Verse 8. Verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. One of my favorite verses. When Jeremiah said, I am a child, I cannot speak. God said, don't say that. He didn't mean... What he's saying was, I'm incapable, which to a certain degree was correct. But when you work with God, you don't discuss lack of capability, you discuss power. So when God said, say not your child, it didn't mean that Jeremiah was the most gifted people on earth, person on earth. It simply meant God wanted him to put the focus not on him, but on God. Are you following me? And so the Bible says, I can do how many things? How? Through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And to let Jeremiah know that God was serious when he said, don't say your child. The Bible says, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. Because he said, I cannot speak. Now, if he had said, I cannot run, the Lord would not have touched his mouth. Are you following me? He might have touched his ankles. If he had said, I cannot jump, the Lord might have touched his gluteal muscles. The Lord directs his power precisely where it is needed. Let us see an example of someone else called by God claiming the inability to speak. Exodus chapter 4. Our subject, children should not be childish. I hope you're praying for me. <clears throat> Do you have Exodus chapter 4, reading from verse 10? And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Now Moses does not say I'm a child. He simply says I can't speak. Now the Bible says that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in word and deed. That's what the Bible says. He was mighty in word and deed, Acts 7, 22. But when God called him, he said, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Now God goes directly to that part of Moses, which he claims does not function well. Who hath made man's mouth who maketh the dumb or the deaf or the seeing or the blind hath not I the Lord because I made the mouth and can fix it because I made the ear and can fix it because I made the eye and can fix it God says therefore now therefore go I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say in 11 God said who made the mouth who makes the deaf or the dumb, the seeing or the blind? Now God says, the creator who made the mouth will be with you. So you have no excuse. And he said, verse 13, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou shalt send. Now he makes no excuse. He still does not want to go. Verse 14, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. 
And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. Now, God says, as Moses insists, I cannot speak. God tells him in verse 11, but I made the mouth. I cannot speak. Verse 13, verse 14, God says, okay, okay, okay. I'll send someone to speak for you. You'll give him the words, he'll just speak them. It's a demonstration of the, the, the lengths to which God goes to give us a chance to serve him. Hmm? Moses said, I can't speak. God said, I can fix your mouth. Moses said, that's fine, but I still can't speak. The Lord said, okay. God is so merciful. The way God just sometimes backs down. Hmm? The Almighty in an argument with a human being and God backs down. All right, your brother can speak. I'll have him speak for you. Verse 15, and thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth and will tell you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. And he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. God makes a beautiful arrangement. You tell Aaron what to say. And Aaron's eloquence will be used to say whatever you tell him. God worked out an arrangement for Moses to serve him. My brothers and sisters, what is your excuse? You can't sing? You can't give a Bible study. You can't pray. You can't knock on the door. You can't do anything. God says, bring your inability to me. Bring your nothingness to me. You know, when uh, Jesus fed the 5,000, that's the only miracle recorded in all four Gospels. Matthew 14, Mark 6, Luke 9, John 6. The feeding of the 5,000. In the book of John, we're told, when he saw a great multitude come unto him, a great company, he saith unto Philip, verse 5 of John 6, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself know, knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them might take a little. Philip said, this is too small. You can't feed five people, far less 5,000. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are these and what are they among so many? Andrew says, I found some food, but the fish are so small. That's what he says. Small fish. The word small is in John. But what are they, are they among so many? The beauty is when Matthew tells the story, Matthew 14, about verse 17, 18, Jesus said, bring them to me. Andrew said, the fish are too small. Now, if I had found a whale or a shark, that would have been a different story. But the fish I found are too small. To feed 5,000. And from a human standpoint, Andrew was correct. From a human standpoint, Abraham should not have had a child at the age of 100. From a human standpoint, a lot of things should never happen. But we do not live our lives from a human standpoint. We must live our lives from a divine point of view. Can somebody say amen? And so Andrew said, what are these? What was this? Hmm? Among so many. But in Matthew's version, Jesus said, bring them to me. You can't speak? Give your mouth to God. You can't sing? Give your voice to God. You can't walk? Give your feet to God. Give your inability. Give your weakness to God. 
God says, or if you have a little talent, God says, give them to me. And when the fish and the bread were given to Christ, under his control, he performed a miracle that resulted in 5,000 people being fed and 12 baskets of food taken up after all had eaten and were filled. The Christian's life must not be lived based on what he or she can do. Let me say that again. We must not live our lives based on what we can do and what we cannot do. We live our lives based on what God can do through us. As my brother, I don't see him. Oh, he's back there. Christian Service, page 254, paragraph 2. There is no limit to the usefulness of one who, setting or putting self aside, makes room for the working of the Holy Ghost upon his heart and lives a life holy, constant, dedicated to God. No limit to the usefulness of someone who makes room for the working of the Holy Ghost on the heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. No limit to the usefulness. That applies to you. That applies to me. It applies to all of us. As you leave this place <clears throat> today, your mind is probably absorbed with thoughts of getting back home, getting ready for when the school term reopens, getting back with your friends, going out, having a nice time. Let me issue a warning. It's biblical, it's not mine. When Jesus refer to the days of Noah and Lot. Here's what Jesus said. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. Now, none of those is a crime. Are you listening to me? It's not a crime to eat God-invented eating. It's not a crime to drink. God invented drinking. It's not a crime to get married. God performed the first ceremony. It's not a crime to give someone in marriage. God gave Eve to Adam. Let's add some more things they were doing. Likewise also, Luke 17, 28, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. Now we go from doing things to sustain yourself, eat and drink, we go to marry, given marriage, the social life. We go to, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded business as usual. In other words, what is Jesus saying? What were they doing when they were lost? They were going about life as usual. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Is it a crime to have a business? No. No. That's what they were doing, and Jesus said they were taken away. Is it a crime to start a family? No. None of the things mentioned between uh, the days of Lot, the days of uh, Noah, none of them are crimes. But they took precedence over God. Remember yesterday's presentation? In love and lost? They took precedence over over God, which means, and this is very frightening, most people who are lost will be decent people, who are responsible, hardworking, returning taxes, going about their duties, not bothering their neighbors, just doing what ordinary citizens do, but not having God as number one. Old and young. I believe I told one of my groups yesterday. When the angels came to Sodom. Exodus 19. The Bible says in verse 4. But before they lay down. You know Lot fed them. Verse 3 of Exodus 19. Not Exodus Genesis. There you go again. Not correcting me. But before they lay down. The men of the city. Even the men of Sodom. Compassed the house round. Both old 
any young. All the people from every quarter. Now, what is every quarter? Let's think of that. Hmm? Let's take Kuala Lumpur. Are there poor sections of Kuala Lumpur? Yes or no? Oh, yes. Are there sections where the rich people live? Surrounded by high walls and guards with submachine guns and bazookas. <laughs> Are there areas where the middle class live? Mm -hmm. The Bible says, these immoral people, they came from every quarter of the city. Sin does not care about class. Those from the gated communities, whose friends are politicians, and who have dinner with the prime minister, they came to sodomize the angels. The middle class, who are professors in universities and bankers, they came to sodomize the angels. The poor class, they came to sodomize the angels. And those with no class, they came to sodomize the angels. And the little children came, the little boys came, either to do it or to watch. Why am I saying that? You're all young. You may think, as I said before, the gospel is for old. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> Thou shalt not kill is for you and for me. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. It's for you and it's for me. I often say I have never seen a youth sermon in the Bible. I just see the gospel. I've never seen a sermon targeting singles or divorcees or widowers or whatever, tall people, fat people. I just see the gospel. And so as you go back, don't forget what you heard. What you learned. You must go back different or this was a waste of time. And that will be childish. You go back with a different mindset. Your mindset is with Christ. Hmm. When the Canaanites attacked the Israelites in Joshua, not Joshua, Judges chapter 4. You don't have to go there. I'll just tell the story. Barak came to Deborah. Deborah was the prophetess. And told her, look, should I go and fight? And she said, yes, go. The Lord will help you. Barak told Deborah, okay, I will go. Say it, say it, say it. If you go with me. I will go if you go with me. And she went with him. The Lord blessed the Israelite army. All the Canaanite soldiers were destroyed. Every single one. The Bible says not one was left. God says to you, go out. Witness for me. You should say to God, I will go. Finish my thought. If you go with me. And what will God say? I'll go with you. I'm, all, I'm ready. I've been ready for 2,000 years. I'm waiting. I'm willing. I'm wanting. I'm eager, says God. Today, we close the book. God says to you, do not tell me you can't. Don't do that. If God says you can, and you say you can't, somebody's wrong. Are you with me? Who's wrong? We are. If God says, go two by two and knock, God never asks us to do something for which he does not give us power to do it. So we have to change the way we think. We must learn to think like God. See the world the way God sees the world. I was in a in my travels, <clears throat> sometimes I run into Mormon young men, your age. I was in Guyana on the South American coast. I was on one side of a river walking with a friend, and I looked across the other side of the river, a fairly broad river, and I saw two young men, dark colored pants, white shirt, dark tie, handbag. And I said, two Mormons. 
going about. They probably live somewhere in the United States, they're in Guyana. Knocking on doors. I was in Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya, East Africa. We were driving by, myself and my Kenyan family. Saw so two, two young men, Mormons, young men. I was in Uganda, going somewhere, saw two young men. Now, I never asked them if they were Mormons. I just knew they were Mormons. Dark pants, white shirt, dark tie, badge, handbag. Knocking. And they have to do that before they go to college. So they're in their late teens, 19, 16, 17. And they have to pay for themselves. Two years of missionary work, they pay for themselves. I have never been anywhere in the world and said, two Adventists. I can't spot Adventists. I'm not asking you to be Mormons. I'm simply saying, if 70-year-old, 17-year-old Mormons can knock, 17-year-old Adventists can knock, somebody say amen. amen. If 18-year-old Jehovah's Witnesses can knock, 18-year-old Adventists can knock, it could be they love their God more than we love ours. In the city of Detroit, I live close to Detroit. I was driving through one Sunday. <clears throat> You come to a red light anywhere in the city on a Sunday morning, you see some black guys, young men in suits, all of them with a bow tie. You know exactly who they are. The Nation of Islam. It's the American version of Islam. And they're selling magazines, raising money, but in a suit, bow tie, selling, raising funds. Two Muslims, two Mormons. And if you see a man and a woman, and a child on Sunday morning, three Jehovah's Witnesses. How do you pick out two Adventists? You can't, because they don't go. I want you to be different. Well, not I, God. My young brothers and sisters, God deserves your best. He really does. Your energy, your mind, so elastic. Your strength, your willingness to go on adventure. All the people are more careful. I don't think that's always good. The younger person will take a chance. And God needs people like that. God needs you. You know, God has angels he could send. Hmm? Did not he send angels to tell the shepherds that Christ was born? Yes. You know, that should not have been necessary. The Jews should have told the whole world. God needs you. Will you let his need go un un unfulfilled? This morning I ask you, put aside your excuses. Put aside your arguments and say to God, like Isaiah, here am I. Finish it for me. Send. God may send you to the house next to yours. When people here send me, they think, okay, I've got to leave Malaysia and go to Alaska. No. He may send you down the street. He may send you to your classroom where you sit every day next to an unbeliever. He may send you to a relative of your own family who has not accepted Christ. Send me does not mean vast geographical distances. Send me can mean the nearest opportunity you have. Send me may mean the person at your office in the cubicle next to yours. Just tell God, you choose the place, the task. All I am offering is a willing heart. I say again, God needs you. He cannot come down and preach himself. He will not let the angels do it. He needs you. How many of you will say with me, Lord, here am I. 
send me. Can I see your right hand? Here am I, send me. Keep your hand up. Stand up. Now let me put your mind at ease. I will not make a call to the front. Relax. You don't have to move to be genuine. A lot of people move and they're not genuine. But I want you to move in your heart. I want you to make a decision. There's something I will do for God. Let me ask you this, and I want you to raise your hands. How many of you have ever directly brought someone to Christ? Can I see your hand? You've directly brought someone to Christ. You were directly responsible, used by... All right, they have 6, 7, 12 hands. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Today is December 30. Am I right or am I wrong? Here's what I want you to tell God. Father, between December 30, 2014... And December 30, 2015, use me to lead one person to you. Now, is that too much? One. Between December 30, 2014, where we are, and December 30, 2015, dear God, use me to lead one person to you. That cannot be too much for a God who sent his son. If you'll make that decision, can I see your right hand? Hands down. I want you to identify three people you'd like to see saved. How many of you have relatives who are not Adventists? Can I see your hands? Oh, okay. There's your evangelistic field. How many of you have friends at school who are not saved? Can I see your hands? Then when the Lord, when you tell God, send me, he'll send you to school. Your family, the office. Write down three names on a piece of paper. I want you to do, not now, but I want you to do that. I want you to carry that paper in your wallet, your purse, wherever you carry a port. You remember I sh showed you three pieces of paper I carry with me all the time? Remember that? Those of you who are in my group, they're right here. To remind me of the, what it costs and takes to uh, serve God consistently. You carry those three names in your wallet wherever you go. And every day you pray over those names. Every day. Now, that is a prayer that God will be happy to answer. Why? Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. But it's long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. Finish the verse. But that all should come. So when you present three names to God, you say, Father, I'd like to see all three. At least give me one, but I'd like to see all three. One is a relative. One is a colleague at school or on the job. One is a neighbor. When you pray, here's how I suggest you pray. You say, Lord, you said... And tell him where he said it. Second Peter 3, 9. You're not willing that. And then call the names. Because salvation is personal. You say, if, you're, if, if it's John, Jack, and James, you say, Lord, you said you're not willing that John, Jack, and James should be lost. You said that, and you can't lie. Then, if you're serious, and speak respectfully, do everything possible and use me to save them. You say, Lord, you said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, that you would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Father, this includes Jenny, Jennifer, and Judy. Look at them, Father. Do not let the blood of Christ go to waste in their lives. Do all you can to save them, and please use me in the process. Pray that prayer every day. And at night, when you're by yourself, <clears throat> take the piece of paper, put it on your bed, spread it before God, tell God, look. When Jeremiah, not Jeremiah, Hezekiah got a threatening letter from the Assyrians, the Bible says he took the letter into the temple and spread it before God and said, Lord, look, you read this. Mm. Now, God knew what was in it before it was written. 
But, Jer- but Hezekiah took it. The Bible says he spread it before the Lord. And well, I read that several years ago. Since then, whenever I pray for people and they give me pieces of paper, I spread the paper on my bed. And I say, when I do crusades, I pray every night during the night, I just spread the pieces of paper on the bed. And I say, Father, look, read these. Three names. The Bible says we are engraved on the palms of God's hands. On his heart. Three names. Who has already thought of three names? Can I see your hand? You've already thought of three names. Ah, God bless you. You already have three names. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Already have three names. Don't start when you leave. Start right where you are. Because you may not make it outside of life. Start right where you are. Three names. Three Praying for someone's salvation is absolutely God's will. And 1 John 14 says, And this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, finish the verse, he heareth us. I'll ask you to confirm your decision. If you will say, Father, use me to lead someone to you between December 32, 14 and December 32, 15, raise your hand again in confirmation. Leave your hand up, Father in heaven. I present to you those for whom Christ shed his blood. Particularly these young men, these young women, this army of youth to whom you have given life, energy, brilliant minds, solid families, good health. Help them to understand their God. You gave them all these things that they might be effective soul winning tools in your hands. In historical sketches, Page 285, paragraph 4, Ellen White writes, Every youth should be impressed with the fact that he is not his own or she, that his strength, his time, his talents belong to God. It should be his chief purpose in life to glorify God and to do good to his fellow men. In the same paragraph, dear God, your servant writes, Every youth, every child has a work to do for the glory of God and for the salvation of souls that are about to perish. Help my young brothers and sisters to understand that if they don't reach out, people may be lost because of their laziness. Ah, God, help us. Help them. Bless them, dear Father. Remove from them a desire for the world. Change their tastes. And let them love spiritual things, Father. Because the Bible says, All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And we're told, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. We're also told in James, anyone who loves the world is an enemy of God. We want to be your friends. One more time, dear God, bless my young brothers and sisters. Bless their families. Take care of any crises in their families, dear God. So many of us smile on the outside, but there's chaos in our hearts. Please, intervene in their family difficulties. Heal, restore, save. And keep them from the clutches of the devil. And use them, dear God, to lead other young people to a life of uprightness, a life of safety, a life that will take them right into the kingdom. As we disperse, take us safely to our homes, dear Father. Remember the family, the families of those who perished on that flight that went down. No one knows where. Father, these catastrophes, you allow them to happen. That we may become tired of this world and long for the world to come. May God have mercy on me. Thank you for this great honor you gave to me. To be a part of this experience. I recommit my life to you today God. Use me. Use my skills. And if necessary you need my life. You can have it. When you come into your kingdom father. Save all of us. And those for whom we have labored. And hasten the day. When this commitment made today. To bring someone to you. Between December 214. And December 215. Hasten that day when these young people will have a testimony. Here is the one I brought to you. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. God bless you. This media was brought to you by Audioverse. 
a website dedicated to spreading God's Word through free sermon audio, and much more. If you would like to know more about Audioverse, or if you would like to listen to more sermons, please visit www.audioverse.org.